Uh, we're in the book of James, so if you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn there. And today is the last message in James, so I hope you're, you're ready, because I am. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, but uh, don't worry, I can talk pretty fast. Um, some of you know that, and uh, some of you are sorry that I'm going to do that today, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I want to show you some pictures and tell you about some stuff as we get into today's message. So if you have a copy of God's Word and you want to turn to, um, to James chapter 4, that's where we'll be, and we're going to go through uh, 4.13 to 5.20 this morning, okay? So as you're finding your way there, uh, what do you think these are? These are not Ninja Turtle socks. That's what I thought too. That's what I thought. These are sandal socks. You, you nailed it. Um, so these are 800 years old. These are the world's oldest. Oh man, I messed up. Well, this is the second thing. Darn. These were supposed to be sunglasses. I don't know if that's on there next. There are sunglasses on there. I just got them out of order. Whatever, it's cool. That's fine. I'm going to tell you about the sunglasses first. So the world's oldest sunglasses were discovered on Baffin Island in Canada, and they were snow goggles designed to reduce, reduce the sun's glare reflecting from the snow. So that's 800 years old. There they are. Uh, and you can t So they've got the slits, so you can still see out of them, right? So they're, they're to minimize the glare. All right, now the oldest socks. Um, and yes, these are sandal socks which you probably have a weird uncle that would love these, right, who always does the wrong thing. If you wear socks with sandals, by the way, you are wrong. I'm just telling you. It's what Crocs are for. Um, so the oldest socks, these are 1,500 years old. Also, by the way, I'm getting this from, like, a website. So as we go on through the dating, like, this, this you'll understand why I think some of these are, are wrong, okay? But so these socks are 1,500 years old. These Egyptian wool socks were designed to go with sandals. They were knitted between... 300 and 499 A.D. and found in the 19th century, okay? The next thing that I hope is up there is the oldest coin. Nope, that's it. Okay, uh, so this coin is 2,700 years old. This is the oldest known coin was found in the ancient Hellenic city of Ephesus. Believe that? Isn't that cool? What's that? This coin? It means somebody had a hole in their pocket. Um. But it was found in Ephesus in Turkey, and uh, it's the one and only, it's decorated side of, features the, a lion's head, right? You can kind of see that now that I said that, right? All right, the next thing is the oldest written recipe. So that's that tablet you had up there. Yeah, believe it or not, this is a recipe card, right? Looks kind of like the ones my wife has scattered about in her, in her books, a little hard to read there. Uh, but this recipe is 5,000 years old, they think. This is a Sumerian beer recipe, believe it or not. Dates all the way back to 3,000 B.C., they believe. Um, the result, beer, is very strong, as you can imagine, and it would contain chunks of bread floating around in it. Sounds good. Um, all right, uh, the next one is should be the oldest shoe. There you go. The oldest shoe is 5,500 years old. Uh, this 5,005-year-old cowhide moccasin was found in a cave in Armenia, preserved by grass and dry sheep dung. And by the way, the left shoe was not found. So I know that this shoe belongs to a child because they only had one of them there. Um, and then lastly that I got up here, I, I hope, is, is the, the oldest instrument. So this is where I, I'm not sure about this. But this oldest instrument, they think, is 40,000 years old. And this was a, a vulture bone that they made into a flute. It was found in southern Germany. And uh, that's, where, that's where they found this. Now, what does all this have to do with what we're talking about in James? Well, let me tie that in for you. Uh, faith preserves. All these things were preserved. Faith preserves that preserves to the end is what we're looking for. That's what I'm looking for. It's wonderful that these were preserved and that we can talk about them and that we can even you know, make jokes about them and those kind of things. But I don't know about you, but life is hard and it only seems to continue to get harder. And as things continue to progress and as the world around us seems to fall deeper and deeper into darkness, I want to make sure that I preserve. I want to make sure that you preserve. And that's what James is talking about here. 
faith that perseveres, that preserves, that continues through the end of time. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, we do thank you for our time together. We ask that you would bless it. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds as we look at this section of James, that we would be taught by your word. You have told us that your word is living and active. So we would ask that you would live and act here with us this morning. It's in your name that we do pray. Amen. So faith that perseveres is first and foremost, if you're a note taker, it is obedient. Uh, maybe that's a surprise to you, maybe not, but that is what James says. Faith that perseveres is obedient. And so they're going to click through as I read through the text and then as we do some uh, exposition here. So James 4, uh, 11 through 17 says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And so the first thing that uh, James shows us here, as far as obedience goes, is we need to beware the sin of criticism. Uh, when we judge our brother, we put ourselves in the seat of God. Did you know that? Now, here's the deal. We do that in right ways and in wrong ways. Now, there's a lot of people out there that will use texts like this, right, uh, that say things like, well, you can't judge me, or only God can judge me, or whatever. Well, the fact of the matter is that discernment and judgment are two different things. Now, what James is talking about here is actual judgment. I cannot pronounce on any of you if you're saved or not. I cannot pronounce on any of you if you're damned or not. I cannot pronounce that on you. That is not my role to do that. That is not my responsibility, thankfully. And I don't have that knowledge. Scripture is very clear. It tells us that in a room like this, unfortunate as it is, the truth is, Jesus said there's going to be wheat and there's going to be tares. Now, if you are familiar with farming in, in any kind of capacity, what that means is basically this. If you plant a crop, there's going to be weeds in the field too. And in that parable that Jesus talks about, he says there's wheat and there's these things called tares, and they look very much like each other. And unfortunately, they look so much like each other that the only way that you can tell is when it's actually time to harvest, that's when you can tell the difference. When it's getting closer to the time to, of, of the actual harvest, then you'll be able to tell which is which. And in that parable, if you remember it at all, they asked like, hey, if there's weeds, if there's tares among the rest of the wheat, should we pull those out? And Jesus said, nope, let them continue to grow up together. And then when the harvest is actually taking place, then we'll take all the wheat, we'll put that in one place, we'll take all the weeds and we'll throw them out. And those are good for nothing except for furnace fire, basically. But we need to beware the sin of criticism. You see, it's easy for us, or maybe I should say it's more acceptable for us, as people in the church, to sit in our ivory towers, so to speak, to look out there at the world, to point the finger at those out there in the world, and to think, those people are screwed up, they ought to be like us. But we also do that in the walls of the church. And, I'm, and both are wrong. We judge one another for the things that we wear. We judge one another if somebody wants to raise their hands or not raise their hands during a praise song. We judge one another if they're here regularly or if they're not here regularly. We judge one another sometimes if they're early to service or if they're running late. There are so many things that we do that we judge one another, and what we need to know is the difference between uh, judgment and discernment, first of all. But we also need to think about what Jesus says here 
in 7.3, he says, Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or Hebrews 5.14, where it says, Solid food is for the mature, but those who have their for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So obedience, we ought to be obedient in our own service to the Lord. And beware the sin of criticizing others. Now obviously there are some sins that are black and white, okay? And that's just how it is, and Scripture talks about that. But we also don't know where that person is in their sanctification. If somebody was saved out of prostitution and she is at the place or he is at the place where they still haven't grown in maturity to understand what modesty looks like, well, then they need grace and mercy and they need somebody to come alongside them and help them and train them. They don't need judgment. Next, beware the sin of carelessness. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I didn't see that in the Bible, Pastor. You're going to have to explain that one. Well, I'm glad you're asking. I I will do my best to do so. And you're right to notice that. Thank you for being a Berean. But let me back up my point for you, okay? So James 4, 13 through 15 talks about that there. And what he talks about is when we make decisions without consulting the Word of God, we confess our lack of concern for the will of God. You know, this is what he said. He said, hey, you're going to go here and you're going to do that thing or you're going to go there and you're going to do that thing. And let me ask you this. Have you considered what God's will is for your life before you make those decisions? Or do you just say, hey, sounds good to me. Sounds like what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And you don't say this, but your heart says this. And to heck with whatever God's plan is for me. Or I guess God will catch up to my plan. I don't know about you, but I am guilty of that. I am a type A kind of person. I see something and I go after it. Now, by God's grace and his mercy, a lot of those things have worked out in my life, okay? I saw Lisa and I said, I'm going to marry her. And hey, that was a good decision, right? But beware the sin of carelessness. We ought to always be asking the Lord, seeking his will in every single decision. Now, there is freedom in a lot of things. So am I telling you, you need to pray and ask the Lord's will for if you should have eggs with toast or without toast every morning? No. However, is it wrong? I mean, let's say that's your argument. So, Pastor, you're saying that I need to pray for whether I should have toast or not toast every single morning? I guess my response would be to you, do you think talking to God about that is too small? Do you think God doesn't love you enough to actually care to have that conversation with you? Do you think that any decision in your life is so small that God doesn't want to hear from you? Beware the sin of carelessness. Proverbs 27.1, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring. To be totally transparent with you, Elisa and I have conversations all the time about what we are to do with the finances we have. I have a desire to make sure that I'm providing for her and the family should anything happen to me. So I want to make sure our retirement is set, right? I would also like to have land and a home someday. And so we're, we're, you know, we're debating, like, what's the market going to do? How is this going to work out? And she is so good at reminding me, hey, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So why don't we just settle down a little bit? Luke 12, 18 through 20, and he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will star my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And so I want to ask you, are you in the habit of carelessness? Are you in the habit of making decisions or going through your life without consulting the Lord and asking Him what you should do each day. Remember, Jesus taught them to pray, give me today my daily bread. Beware the sin of callousness is the next thing He talks about there. This is 16 through 17 of chapter 4. When you know what is right and fail to do that thing, our sin hardens our hearts towards God. So, for example, we just talked about this. 
And maybe I ruffled some of your feathers because you didn't know where, and so I'm going to go back to this right now. Remember that recipe? And it was about beer, right? And I said, sounds good. Some of you thought, oh, he's joking because who wants bread in their beer? Some of you may have thought, does he mean that he likes beer? I don't know which one you were, and I don't really care. But here's the point. The Bible doesn't say you can't drink beer. It says you can't get drunk. Now, if you have ever struggled with alcohol, you ought not to drink, period. I don't care if it's 2,000-year-old beer with chunks of bread in it or whether it's a small sip of whatever. We need to beware the sin of callousness. When we know what is right and we fail to do it, it is sin and it hardens our hearts. Now, I want you to actually read what the Scripture says. Whoever knows, what, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Which means this, in a room this size, it might be totally okay and appropriate for you to enjoy a beer with dinner. Great. But for somebody else in this room, if they do that, it is sin. Beware the sin of callousness, though. It is my fear for my own heart, so it's my fear for our hearts in general, that we tend to know what is right and still fail to do it because it's either convenient or pleasurable. And Scripture says that when we do that, our hearts begin to get hardened. Sometimes my sweet little girl, she'll rub my hands and she'll ask me, not now that she's older, she does this less, right? But little kids, you know, they'll feel your hands and they'll say, what are these? What are these? Why is your hands like this? And I'll say, well, those are calluses. Well, what do you get those from? Well, I don't know. Well, whatever you do. You, I know you're probably thinking to yourself, what in the world are you doing, Pastor, that you get calluses from? Is your keyboard that rough? You need a better chair in your office there? Well, listen, I wasn't always just sitting in the chair all the time. And so when you work with your hands, you all know, when you work with your hands, you get working hands, right? You get those calluses. You get those things. The same things happen to our hearts. When we rub our hearts up against sin and foulness or lackadaisical attitudes and things like that, our hearts grow callous too. Romans 2.15 says, they show the work of the law that is written on their hearts while their consciences also bear witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I've told you failings of myself in the past. There's been times where I have felt like the Holy Spirit is telling me, hey, share the gospel with this person. And my response was, that's inconvenient for me right now. I'm not going to do that. Or it was, that person looks rough. I would rather not talk to them right now. Or, hey, my family's here. We're supposed to be doing family time. I don't really want to take away time from that. That's a good thing, right? Family time. I want to be doing that instead of doing this. And then I am grieved afterwards, and I think about verses like this, and I pray, Lord, please do not allow my heart to be hardened. Please forgive me for that sin. I knew that was right. I chose not to do it, so it's sin. Please forgive me for that, for I did not listen to the Holy Spirit, and please continue to keep my heart soft and remove those calluses. So preserving faith is obedient because it is confident. If you're a note taker, that's the next thing. Obedient faith is confident. Well, confident in what? Well, we have to continue on with James chapter 5, 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So, preserving faith is obedient because it's confident. Well, what is it confident in? Well, unfortunately, firstly, that he is coming to judge the sinful. James tells us that. Not only James, but other scriptures too tell us that one day there will be a judgment. So, friend, if you're here this morning and you don't have salvation in Christ Jesus, it is my duty to warn you that there is a day that you will stand before God. 
and you will have to give an account. And unfortunately, your account, like mine, all of ours, if, you, if left to yourself, your account will come up short. And because of your sin, God will have no choice but to punish you for all of eternity. And you're like, man, that's really harsh. It was just a short period. I'm going to give you a real quick theology lesson. You ready for this? God is bigger than you understand. Short lesson, right? The bottom line of that is this. You think your sin is small and you have not even a frame of reference to how egregious this is to a holy, perfect, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient God. So check yourself before you wreck yourself, basically, okay? And so what Scripture says is, He is coming to judge the sinful. All of us are in severe danger. Now here, in the context, he's talking about those that are misusing their finances, all this kind of thing. This is not a sermon about your tithing or your giving. This is not a sermon about first world problems and how you spend your money. What this is, is a warning passage. He is coming to judge the sinful. Genesis 17, 17 says, <clears throat> then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, should a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And the answer is, yeah, laugh all you want. John 2, 19 says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up again. And they thought, you're crazy. And guess what? Three days later, he rose from the dead. The point of those two passages that tie into this is God says in his word, one day all mankind will be held to an account, to a standard, and all those who are outside of salvation will be thrown into the lake of fire where there will be eternal punishment and torment for all of eternity. And I don't want that for you. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. If you're a note taker, you can write that down. But verse 12 of that says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they have done. Verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. But James doesn't end here. And in the texts, maybe you can't see it, but in James 5, 1 through 6, he says, he is coming to judge the sinful, absolutely. But he is also coming to deliver the faithful. And that is the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is this. He, James says it here. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your field. You kept this back. They're crying out against you. What does it say about their cries? The cries have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Amen? He is coming to deliver the faithful. What does that mean to be faithful? So, so are you saying, Pastor, that God is coming to judge us, and if we're obedient, if we keep the law, then we're going to be saved? Well, he does tell us to, obe to be obedient, right? We can be obedient because he's confident that he is judging the sinful and that he is delivering the faithful, though. Now, who among us is faithful? Raise your hands. Oh, are you? Praise the Lord, because I'm not, not always. But here's what it says, John 3, 16. You know that, right? We all know that, but not all of us always know the context. But it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So Revelation, again, if we go there, 21, 1 through 5, in verse 3 there it says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be, them, uh, will be there with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And then in verse 5 he says, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Brother and sister, we can be obedient because we're confident that He already saved us. That when I put, when you put our hope and our trust in what Jesus has done, then that's it. 
On the cross, he said, it is finished. And so while, yes, we ought to be obedient, we ought to be obedient not out of confidence in the fear of judgment, but confidence in the reward of eternal salvation. And in the joy of that salvation, in the joy of what Jesus has done, it ought to then bring us to a place of obedience. Does that make sense? And so we ought to obey God, not out of simple fear of wrath, but out of joy because of love, out of charity towards our our, our, our Lord. We love because he first loved us. And so moving on then, preserving faith is obedient because it is confident, and because it is confident, it will be and it should be patient. James 5, 7 through 18. This is a large section of text, so please bear with me and practice this skill right now, patience, as we read this together. James 5, 7 through 18 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers. Now, remember the context of this, right? He just said God is coming to judge, and those who are faithful, those who are calling out to him, he has heard their word. And so now he says, so therefore, because we know God's coming, because he, we know that not only is he coming to judge, but he's also coming to deliver those who are, who are uh, in Christ Jesus, basically. So I'm putting words in James' mouth now, but, but that's what he means. Okay, so then he says here, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door as an example of suffering and patience. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may be not fall under the condemnation. (coughs) Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. So persevering faith is obedient because it's confident. And because it's confident, it will be patient. Now, what do you mean patient? Well, I mean two things, uh, four things, really, I think that James talks about here. The first is patient towards the Savior. Well, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is this. I'm ready for Jesus to come, aren't you? I look around at the world around me, my sweet children that I'm about to ship off into this crazy place, and I don't know what is going to be brought to them. I've seen what's happened in the world since I was little up until now. Some of you who are more senior in your sainthood than I am, you know what I'm talking about, and it only looks like it's going to continue to progress into wickedness. Come, Lord Jesus, come. But should he tarry, beloved, what will we do? Will we fret? Will we mourn? Will we lose heart? Will we, like the wicked, say, when is he going to come? Or will we be patient towards the Savior? He also tells us that we must be patient toward the saint, patient towards one another. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. I'm going to sin against you. I'm going to wrong you. I'm going to be harsh with you or something like that. I'm going to not do something that you think that I should do, or I'm going to do something that you think that I shouldn't do. Are you able to forgive me? Are you able to see that I am also just a mere man, just like you are, sinner saved by grace? And oh, how I need grace. Are we patient toward one another? Are we patient towards those in the world? Patient toward the Savior that he might be in the process of saving someone else and making them into a saint. 
Uh, there's this um, song by Jimmy Jimmy Needham, and one of the verses in the song, or one of the word, one of the things lyrics in the song that he uses, and I love it's a good great plan words, and he says he has taken this stain and made it a saint. I'm like, yeah. Also, though, my friends, be patient in suffering. Again, in a room this size, I mean, there are brothers and sisters who aren't here right now because of suffering. And not all suffering, right, is physical. There is mental, there is emotional, there is spiritual affliction. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? I mean, there is spiritual oppression also. I think of people like, you know, uh, Joni Erickson Tata, right? Other men of the faith, other women of the faith that have went before us that have suffered so much. Be patient in your suffering. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. Romans 8.18 8, For I consider that the uh, sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing to the glory. Do you know who wrote those words? Paul did. Let me just remind you about Paul for a minute. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Dude received 39 lashes. So let me help you with this. 39 whips, whippings, five different times. I'm not good at math, but that's a lot, more than I want. I remember one time that I got spanked by my dad that was pretty rough, let alone the five times that I received. Now, hold on, just so you know, if you know me at all, I did get spanked more than one time. I got spanked plenty. But I remember one time in particular is what I'm saying. And so Paul tells us about the five times that he received these lashings. And in that section, in 2 Corinthians 11.24, he goes through this gamut. He says, I was shipwrecked. I was uh, serpents. There was robbers. I was busted up. I was beaten down. I was dismayed and almost destroyed, basically. And he tells us we're but a vapor. That's what James says. So we need to be patient in our suffering, too. And I'm not minimizing your suffering at all. I know some of us are dealing with some serious things. And I wish that I could take it away from you. But also, then, we need to be patient in our supplication. 1 Thessalonians. You know, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Do you know that? It's not Jesus wept. That's what everybody thinks. Jesus wept. That's not it. The shortest verse is pray without ceasing. This is one Greek word. Pray continuously. You can memorize that verse, right? Pray without ceasing. Be patient in our supplication. Luke 18, 1 through 7, he tells them this. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Did you know that even the men who walked with Jesus for those three years, all 12 of them, Jesus told them a parable. Why? So that they would pray and not lose heart. You know, it's a very human thing. It's very human to pray and to think, God's not listening. He's not answering this. Why isn't he working on this? And so remember today's message. If you get nothing else out of this, be patient towards the Savior who sees you and who loves you and who died for you and who will one day make everything right but it may take a long, long time in our eyes. But remember to God, a year as is in a thousand, well, how's that? No, a thousand years as in a day, and a day as in a thousand years. So our time frame is just not the same as God's. And we need to understand and choose humility and say, you know, I don't understand why X keeps happening or why I haven't been healed or why that person isn't saved or whatever that is. But understand patience toward the Savior, patient in suffering, patient in supplication, and continue to practice 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. So lastly, and maybe most importantly, preserving faith is obedient because it's confident. And because it's confident, right, it's patient. And so preserving faith is patient Because that is the outflow of the main attribute of love. 
because the bottom line is none of anything that I've said is anything that applies to you if you don't absolutely love Jesus. I mean, love him more than you love life itself, more than you love your spouse, more than you love your children, more than you love your job or your hobby or your health. James 5, 19 through 20 tells us, whoops, they went too fast or we both did it, whatever, it's my fault is what it is. But James 5, 19 through 20, thank you. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. We need to have love for the sinner. We need to go after each other. I don't know when it became a thing that we all think that to show up to this place every Sunday that we've got to be perfect or pretend to be and that when we ask one another, like, how are you doing? The only answer that's acceptable is either great or fine. I don't know who made that rule, but that's garbage. When I talk to you and I say, how are you doing? If you're not doing fine, I want to hear, and I want to pray with you, and I want to share that burden with you. And I believe, and I could be wrong, I believe you all want that too, from me and for me. And I also believe, and I could be wrong, but you all not only want that from me and for me, you want that with each other. Because that's what connection is. That's what love is. Love for the sinner. When we love one another, we know that we have Christ within us. He says that. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if you don't love one another, or if you have no desire for that, that should freak you out this morning. And secondly, love for the Savior. 1 John 4, 7 through 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. When we know Christ, I mean, when we know Christ, we love him. Do you know Christ? Do you love Christ? And if the answer is yes, I want to I wanna beg for you this morning, how can you love him more? How can you show him love more? 1 Corinthians says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like what James was just talking about. So in closing, the recap, faith that preserves or perseveres to the end is obedient to God the Father, confident in Christ the Son, patient through the Holy Spirit, and loves well because he first loved us. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, this sermon is too hard for me to live out. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that you would give us grace to be more like this. I pray that you would help us to have this kind of persevering faith. That we would be ever increasingly obedient to the Father because of our confidence in Christ. And being patient through the Holy Spirit and loving well because you loved us. I pray that you would grow in every single one of us a greater degree, that we would decrease and you would increase. Because our hearts long for that and because that is exactly what you deserve. And so it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's.